So, you saw the title of the video. I think the ghost of Molly McGee is going to end by finally giving Scratch a life as a human on Earth. Because he never lived a human life in the first place. I mean, as opposed to what? Molly dying and joining Scratch in the afterlife so they can stay BFFs? The ghost and Molly McGee! So, my fellow Dimension Hoppers, it has been a while since I checked in on this show. Previously, when I made a video about it, the first episode hadn't even come out, and despite my warning at the end, do not ship these characters. There were certainly those that did not heed it, and I will spare you the related fan art. But aside from that, let's talk for a second. Is the ghost of Molly McGee as good as I expected? Well, yeah. First is, of course, the characters. They're so much fun, and Dana Snyder as Scratch is the clear standout here. There's gotta be at least one line from him each episode that catches me just completely off guard. Wait till you see what I have planned. Ah, we're going to murder him! What? No! Molly and the family are nice, there's some fun one-off characters here and there, and the expanded cast feels decently fleshed out early on. I also really like Libby as a foil for Molly, and the fact that they get to explore aspects of Jewish culture through her family is great. The songs are fun, none are really certified bangers as of yet, but Lose Lose, Best Friend Bop Mitzvah, and Regular Guy have all popped up in my head from time to time. But honestly, out of all the music, the end credits has stuck with me the most. It's so catchy! The show's also got that glossy, smooth animation you'd expect from Mercury Filmworks with some crazy expressions and a gorgeous color palette. And so far, the best episodes of the show are easily the two-parter where Molly reveals Scratch to Libby and the Hanukkah episode. That Hanukkah one was just incredible. But the thing I was most interested about going into the show, as you know, was the overarching story and lore. The creators Bill Motz and Bob Roth have maintained that the show will work on an episodic basis without needing too much context for any episode, but it'll still have overarching stories. And we've all seen what Amphibia has done with that same strategy. <laughs> But seriously, they've also maintained that the show won't get dark even into its further season runs. So let's take a look at the first arc the show has tackled, Molly feeling conflicted over lying to Libby about Scratch's existence. From now on, I'm going to be completely honest with Libby no matter what. Hey Molly, who are you talking to? No one! It plays largely in the background for most of the episodes until the two-part special Scratch the Surface and Friend Off. And in all honesty, I'm actually really glad they wrote this arc so fast. Many lesser shows would have dragged this out over an entire season or more, but now this solidifies the first half of season one as the time Libby doesn't know about Scratch, which is actually really neat and helps to give each chapter of the show its own identity. So that brings us back to how this show interacts with plot and continuity. Based on what we've seen in the first arc, it maintains really strong continuity, going so far as the creators pulling an episode before release as it would have created a small continuity error. And the show is clearly free to let its characters grow and change throughout the plot of the series. What all this means is that Bill and Bob have thought this show through from start to finish, even if there is room within the series' run for changes to the story beats along the way as it goes. So after all that, here's what you clicked on the video for. I think there's enough hints in the show already to guess its big third act twist. And it's that Scratch never actually lived a life on Earth as a human. Let's back up real quick to the first episode. As we all know from the first scene in the show, if Scratch fails to keep the misery levels and brighten up, he could be sentenced to the flow of failed phantoms for all eternity. That is some major stakes to put forward in the first few minutes of the show, and I think that's ultimately going to be the fight back and forth for most of the series. From the tease that ends the first episode, you can see that the misery levels in Brighton are going down. And that's the fight. Scratch slowly learns to like Molly and enjoy some of the simple pleasures of existence in addition to food, but as he grows to care about the McGee family, you can see how he wants more and more to lift the family's spirits and help them out, especially in the Christmas episode. You did it, Scratch! You saved Christmas! Consider it my present to you, Mom. Now where's my present? <laughs> the ghost and Molly McGee. So imagine this from season to season. Brighton gets better and brighter, truly living up to its name, until we get to the final confrontation. Scratch versus the Ghost Council. It seems like some concept art of Molly defending Scratch before the Ghost Council was included in the show pitch, and I imagine that that would be a really important beat of the show, whether it ends up being a season one thing or something like the grand finale of the series. But of course, what we do know is that the Ghost Council is the primary antagonistic force of the series, who we know next to nothing about. I mean, I'm sure we'll learn about them and their motivations eventually, but the Ghost Society hierarchy hasn't been explored all that well so far. It seems to function similarly to human culture with arts and food, the only difference being that well, there's no real end game to ghost life. 
and you can still impact things in the real world if you so choose. But there's classism, and some people are still rude and mean, which makes me wonder who runs this place and decides that the purpose of ghost kind needs to be to cause misery on Earth. Is it this grim reaper looking fellow, the chairman? Mr. Tower of Dower here, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> All the other ghosts are presumably humans who have died according to the show's lore we've seen so far, so why would any of them want to bring misery to people on Earth? Or support a ghostly system that mandated it? I really think it's the chairman that's behind all this, and I expect we'll learn a lot more about him later on in the series. But because this is the system that exists, I think perhaps the upper class spirits have tried experiments to create ghosts to do the dirty work for the chairman, so that any ghost that wants to live in the higher class of the afterlife can. So that brings us back to my theory. Scratch never lived a life as a human. I think he was the result of an experiment by the ghost council to create a ghost to solely cause misery that backfired. Now here's the first and biggest piece of evidence for this. Scratch never talks about his life on Earth. In a show with such attention to continuity and a focus on comedy, how could we be this far into the series without Scratch making a back when I was alive joke? I mean, you you connect to other generations, there, there's so much you could do with that. All of his known experience seems to come from simply observing humans and life on Earth rather than living any of it himself. This would also explain his childlike mannerisms as well as his general incompetence. As before the show began, it really seems like Scratch is treated like a loser in the ghost world. Not just by the council, but everyone. Despite being great at his job, which in theory should give him status. Which is so weird, but it gave me the vibes of another similar Disney movie. Wreck-It Ralph. You will never be a racer, because you're a glitch, and that's all you'll ever be. <laughs> you are not invited, Scratch. But you are dismissed. This club is only for popular ghosts, not the worst of the worst. Penelope is cast aside by everyone because their memories have been altered to view her as a glitch rather than a part of the game when King Candy took over. That's the only reason she's mistreated. But the plot point I'm taking here is that perhaps the reason Scratch is ignored is because no one wants him to know that he never really had a life on Earth. Except Jeff, who's his friend out of just pure incompetence. Heck, even Molly and Libby, two of the most curious characters I've seen in an animated series, have yet to ask Scratch once any question about his life on Earth. You'd think that would be something that would come up if you were best friends with a ghost, right? Or an actual detective who likes to sniff out the truth? Which brings me to my second point, his name. Scratch. That's a pretty uncommon name among humans. And we know that ghosts retain their human names and memories from good old Abe Lincoln. But Scratch. What if that's his name because he was literally made from Scratch? Like, from nothing, as an experiment. So, presuming the show would end with Scratch coming to this realization about his past, it would lead to a very satisfying conclusion, should he be granted the ability to truly experience life as a human at the end of the series. And hopefully the ghost council and the chairman become inhappified by Molly or something, or at least own up to their mistake of experimenting with creating supernatural life and mistreating Scratch. I don't know. That just seems like a really good way to end the series, bringing closure to Scratch's journey. But as I was writing out this theory, I did a little bit more digging into the name Scratch, and it turns out that in history, it's actually a nickname for the devil. Like, THE devil. It's more commonly phrased as Old Scratch or Mr. Scratch, but still, that can't be a coincidence, right? What if there's more to the Wreck-It Ralph connection than I thought? What if this chairman guy dethroned Scratch as the true devil, gave him a complete memory wipe, and took his spot as leader of the underworld, banishing Scratch to a town where no one would ever know or care about him until Molly? This theory has far greater implications to the end of the show than my last one, as a conspiracy as big as Scratch being Lord of the Underworld means that after his character growth in the show, he would presumably want to ban Misery everywhere, making for another very nice ending to the series. Now, I do need to address the Ghost Council and All Systems know. In the episode, they offer Scratch a promotion on the Council to the ghostly elite that he has to say no to. Oh, misery levels have been on the rise in your town! Very impressive work, which is why we'd like to invite you to join the Elite Ghost Society! No. <gasps> Scratch, consider carefully because we will not ask you again, ever, for the rest of eternity. Will you join the Elite Ghost Society? No, I will not. I maintain that they either knew about the curse and were playing a cruel joke on him here, which would be totally in character, or they didn't know about the curse and just wanted to play a mean joke anyway and tease him, and they would have told him they were joking if he said yes. 
But no matter what you think about these theories, there's got to be a reason that Scratch never references his life on Earth at all. I just can't imagine Scratch not referencing how his best friend on Earth was better, or how he celebrated Christmas on Earth, or other family members of his being ghosts. And his poor reputation in the show seems to come entirely from the ghost world and not the human world. There's just so much left unsaid about Scratch, and I firmly believe that he never lived a life on Earth as a human, at least until the show addresses it. So let me know what you think in the comments below, Dimension Hoppers. Which theory is your favorite? I mean, I guess the other theory is that he died as a baby, and, and that's why he doesn't know anything about his life on Earth. The Ghost and Molly McGee! Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you back in Dimension 1. <laughs> Alrighty, Happy New Year, Dimension Hoppers. Thank you so much for tuning in this December. I didn't get to do an outro on either of those videos, but to all of you who watched the Shaggy and Scooby-Doo retrospective and Amphibia Reanimated, thank you so much, and especially to those who are part of Amphibia Reanimated. I think it turned out so incredible, and it's one of my favorite things that I've ever done for the channel. But about this video, yeah, I'm really excited to see the Ghost of Molly McGee return in a month or so. I know this video was a little bit scattershot, but I think I put out some good ideas there, so hopefully some of you will be able to elaborate on these things and kind of theorize yourselves in the comments. Thank you so much for watching, and have a happy new year.